Mental illness has existed in the world for as long as people have been alive, and the medical treatment for these conditions has certainly advanced far from beyond what they used to be. People genuinely thought that drilling holes in your head would cure mental disorders. Thankfully, we stopped doing that, and nobody has ever had a bad idea ever again. But it is interesting to see what the lives of these people were like back in their time, so let's explore just that, shall we? I feel the best place to start is with the aforementioned head drills. It's professionally known as trepanation, which, fun fact, is also the oldest surgical procedure documented in human history. Dating all the way back to 6500 BC, trepanation was done to remove a circular section of the skull, allowing for the release of pressure or fluids that were believed to be causing various ailments, such as mental illness. This practice was rooted in the belief that supernatural demons were responsible for these conditions. For thousands of years, people held the notion that freeing the demons trapped inside people's skulls would alleviate mental illness. However, in 400 BC, Greek physicians began to question this prevailing belief. Took them long enough? They challenged the idea that supernatural forces alone were responsible for mental illness, marking a significant shift in understanding that took approximately 6,100 years to emerge. This pivotal moment in the history of mental health laid the foundation for future developments and approaches, steering away from the supernatural explanations and paving the way for more comprehensive understanding and treatments. Fast forwarding to 1819, we stumble upon some intriguing newspaper clippings that offer a glimpse into the distressing state of insane treatment during that era. To put it bluntly, it was abysmal. According to E.T. Gundlach, an asylum operated in a manner that dehumanized its residents, treating them as mere possessions. Around 1,400 individuals were crammed into dimly lit hallways provided with nothing more than chairs for seating and twiddling their thumbs. What's truly striking is Gundlach's observation that none of the patients displayed any violent tendencies. However, this was likely a result of the asylum deliberately concealing them during tours, only doing this so that they could portray a false sense of control. Regrettably, very few patients were engaged in any meaningful activities. Now, I am of course not advocating that we put institutionalized persons in coal mines. Everybody knows that only children should work there. You know, just maybe something to keep their hands busy so that they don't go all feral and try killing each other while the nice journalist man is over so that they don't have to get locked in the room closet. Something like that, I guess. Ah, uh, but hey, what can you do? That's just how asylums were run in the 19th century. Hey, speaking of asylums, Girl Interrupted is a captivating memoir by Susanna Kaysen that recounts her two-year stay at a mental institution in the 1960s. It's an honestly unforgettable read that delves into Kaysen's personal journey and her intricate relationships with her fellow patients. The book offers a raw and unfiltered portrayal of mental illness, highlighting the humanity and shared experiences of these individuals who found themselves in a challenging predicament with only each other to rely on. It's a thought-provoking glimpse into the real-life complexities of mental health. I should also note that there is a movie adaptation. It's faithful enough, mostly, except for how they just change the backstories of one of the people in the book, lying for seemingly no reason, other than to make it a more entertaining watch or whatever. It's far too dark of a topic for the tone of this video, but if you've seen the movie, you know. And if you're planning to watch the movie, I implore you to do some background research to understand the narrative the movie portrays is inaccurate to what actually happened. But what if we had a way to prevent mental illness? A question asked by me just now. Well, that's where the idea of mental hygiene stemmed from, too. Mental hygiene is an idea that dates to 1843, having first been put into practice by one William Sweetser. After he was in the Civil War, he imagined that people would care about another's sanity, and would band together as a community to prevent one another's mental stability to crumble at the seams. And like every person to have a good idea, somebody ended up doing it better than them. Adolf Meyer was this person. He was in a mental health facility for some time. After being released, he wrote a paper called The Problem of Aftercare and the Organization of Societies for the Profexless of Mental Disorders. He then further pushed for mental hygiene to be commonplace in schools and workplaces all over the country, until a bunch of scientists said, Hey, you know you have, like, no scientific evidence at all that any of what you say is true and that how there is no proof that encouraging community will do anything to prevent mental disorder. Sweetser then hired an entire team of researchers, one of whom was named Paul Lemkow, who was trained by Meyer to be a psychiatrist. After working with Meyer, Lemkow had a very strong desire to see his mentor's ideas put into fruition. So finally, in 1914, Lemkow wrote a book. And people liked it. After years of dedicated effort, the National Institute of Mental Health was established in 1963 as an integral part of the School of Hygiene and Public Health. A more recent example illustrating the significance of collective action is the National Alliance on Mental Health, or NAMI for those who like acronyms. This inspiring organization was born in 1979. 
When Harriet Shelter, Beverly Young, and their families joined forces to advocate for enhanced mental health care on a global scale. Since its inception, NAMI has played a crucial role in shaping the mental health policies, combating the harmful stigma around mental illness, and positively impacting the lives of individuals and families affected by these conditions. With an unwavering commitment to their cause, NAMI continues to be a powerful voice and driving force within the mental health community, tirelessly working towards the realization of a more inclusive understanding and compassionate society. Unlike certain platforms that seem to attract their fair share of mentally ill individuals, NAMI does a good job at making society not worse. How we understand mental illness medically is very important. That is where the DSM comes in, standing for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. The first real entry was published back in 1952 with a DSM-1, which gave a basic framework for diagnosing mental disorders. Then in 1980 came along the DSM-3, bringing in a big change with the structured criteria for diagnoses. The DSM-4 came next in 1994, fine-tuning the system with a more specific criteria. Finally, we have the latest edition, the DSM-5, released in 2013. It introduced a fancy dimensional approach and included new research findings. Today, the DSM continues to be the go-to sidekick for mental health professionals. Having a real guideline for how to classify and identify mental illness is so far removed from the head drillings and the lobotomies of the past. Hey, speaking of lobotomies, I didn't really talk about those, did I? Well, I really should, considering how important it was to the history of discovering mental illness.